Missiles continue to rain down on Ukrainian cities on the 13th day of invasion as Ukraine accused Russia of shelling humanitarian corridors, making it impossible for civilians to flee. In the latest, Russia's defense ministry had said that it would open corridors from 9 a.m. in Ukraine time, listing routes from the cities of Kiev, Mariupol, Kharkiv and Sumy, all of which have been under heavy attacks. But Ukraine did not initially respond to the offer with which with President Zelensky instead accusing Moscow of hampering evacuating efforts by mining roads and destroying buses. Russia on Monday had proposed the creation of similar corridors, but Ukraine refused to evacuate its citizens as four of Moscow's six proposed corridors led straight to either Russia or its ally Belarus. Була домовленість про гуманітарні коридори. Чи спрацювала вона? Замість неї спрацювали російські танки, російські гради, російські міни. Вони навіть замінували дорогу, яка, яку погоджували для підвезення продуктів і ліків для людей, для дітей. Well, let's talk more about this. Our correspondent Oli Barat is joining us live from Latvia. Oli, good to see you. Maybe you can start by telling us the humanitarian situation in Latvia and why are the evacuation routes facing criticism? The humanitarian situation here in Latvia is uh, not one of great alarm at this point. This is not a major route out for uh, refugees from Ukraine, uh, certainly there is uh, an eye being kept here on whether there is going to be a large exodus from Russia itself uh, should people start uh, considering that they need to leave that country. And certainly there is a large Russian-speaking, uh, ethnic Russian population here in Latvia, which is, as I say, keeping a very keen eye on events over the border. Uh, Latvia also borders Belarus. And so it is certainly uh, something that is being very closely watched here. Um, in terms of those humanitarian corridors, there is a great deal of scepticism here in Latvia, in Ukraine as well, in, in other uh, countries in Eastern Europe and in the West too, about uh, w w exactly how those uh, humanitarian corridors may or may not be observed. Uh, 24 hours ago, we had that offer of humanitarian corridors and a ceasefire from Russia, but the Ukrainians described that as immoral. They were particularly worried about the idea of humanitarian corridors being offered to uh, Ukraine, uh, to Russia, excuse me, and to Belarus. They said that that was not uh, at all what citizens in those four Ukrainian cities wanted to do. They didn't want to leave, the Ukrainians said, for Russia or Belarus for a country that is currently invading theirs, they say, and for a country that is currently aiding an invasion of their nation. When it comes to Latvia, yesterday was a, a, a very busy day of diplomacy here. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in town. He had traveled from Lithuania. He had a press conference there with officials. He also um, had a press conference here, too. And he also met with the Israeli foreign minister, Yair Lapid, uh, saying that he wanted to check notes about how Israeli diplomacy with the Russians had been continuing and whether there were indeed uh, any signs of daylight in that regard. Right. Um, the, uh, the diplomacy continues today here in Latvia. Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, is in town. He will be visiting Canadian troops who are stationed here in Latvia. We also have a visit from the NATO chief, Jens Stoltenberg. I'm sure we will hear NATO solidarity and resolve stressed again. I'm sure we will also hear questions for Jens Stoltenberg about whether NATO could be involved in enforcing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. And I'm sure, again, we will hear Jens Stoltenberg say that that is not currently part of the plan, that that would uh, risk a, a wider conflict with Russia that NATO allies simply don't want to be involved in. For Antony Blinken, he leaves here and he goes to Estonia, continuing that journey around the Baltic states, which he describes uh, here in Latvia yesterday as a wall of democracy against what he sees as Russian uh, aggression on the other side. He will also, before heading home to the United States, 
visit with uh, Emmanuel Macron, we expect, in Paris, uh, trying to get a sense of whether Emmanuel Macron's attempts at diplomacy with Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin uh, have shown any signs of success at all. Oli, let's stick to that. Some of the Baltic nations are nervous of being in the shadows of Russia and claim Putin may expand the war to their countries, despite assurance by the United States that NATO will protect them from Russia. Did you get that sense of fear when you arrived in Latvia? And are they confident with NATO? There is a real sense of anxiety here in Latvia. Absolutely, when Antony Blinken was here, it, what the, the Latvians want to hear is that expression of solidarity uh, with those Baltic nations, that Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, but also that expression, that reiteration of the US guarantee that if any NATO state were to be attacked, that the Americans would come to their assistance as they are required to do. That is very important for the Latvians to hear when they have foreign leaders in town. I'm sure we will hear uh, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, ask the same thing. La the Latvian Foreign Minister, standing alongside Antony Blinken here in Riga yesterday at a press conference, said that he hopes that the American troop presence here will become something that is even more permanent than it already is. They very much see the American guarantee militarily as something very important indeed. Uh, Latvia is a country that borders Russia. It borders Belarus as well. It is a NATO member. It is a European Union member. They see what is unfolding in Ukraine and it makes them very worried about exactly what might happen next. Now, that doesn't mean that Latvians think that there is going to be an imminent invasion of their country, but they do feel that nervousness and that anxiety. There's also a strong sense here of solidarity with the Ukrainians. Every street you walk down, you see a Ukrainian flag flying and fluttering uh, in the wind. Uh, there is a sense here that they are watching what is uh, going uh, on not very far away from here, very closely indeed. Live from Latvia, Oli Barat, thank you very much for your insights and for talking to us today. Let's continue talking about this. Yegar Brailian is joining us uh, live from Kyiv. He's a journalist based in Kyiv. Yegar, welcome to We On. Start by telling us the situation on ground in the capital of uh, Ukraine. We have been talking about Russian forces advancing to the capital. Any update on that? Uh, good morning, but I'm not in Kyiv now. I'm in Lviv. Uh, it's Western Ukraine. And here we can see a lot of refugees who try to reach uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, Romania, Moldova. Uh, so uh, uh, up for now, uh, the most important uh, topic to discuss is the humanitarian corridor, which was agreed uh, between Ukraine and Russia. And uh, today, Deputy, Price Minister, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister uh, for the reintegration of temporary occupied territories of Ukraine, Irina Verishuk. Uh, she uh, told that uh, uh, it was agreement about the uh, accord uh, between uh, such uh, cities as uh, Suma and Poltava, uh, southeast from Kiev. It's uh, a center of uh, Sumer Oblast, Sumer region. And so uh, uh, there would be following route Sumer, Golubivka, Lohvica, Lubny, and Poltava. So, uh, and uh, uh, this statement was uh, clarified by uh, Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, sent an official letter to uh, international organization that uh, it will be humanitarian corridor but after all uh, there are still uh, problems uh, with uh, uh, this humanitarian corridor why because uh, russians just uh, shoot uh, at civilians while uh, 
they uh, wanted to uh, to flee from uh, their native uh, cities, towns, or villages. So okay. that's why uh, Russians are not willing to uh, form these humanitarian corridors. And uh, yesterday, uh, during uh, the third round of negotiations, uh, it was agreed uh, for some new humanitarian corridors, and we hope uh, that uh, it, uh, it will be realized. And uh, after all, uh, now uh, uh, Europe uh, is facing uh, the biggest uh, 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 refugee crisis after the Second World War. It's not uh, Syria in uh, 2015, uh, it's not uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia during the 90s. It's uh, far more worse. So uh, uh, that's why uh, all uh, international organizations, including the United Nations, other, they have to, and they actually help in Ukraine, uh, coping with uh, this uh, crisis and uh, up for now uh, the situation uh, is not so critical so uh, Ukrainian armed forces fight back they counterattack Russian forces all right north uh, near Sumy, Chernikiv, near Kiev yes and uh, uh, I suppose that uh, uh, all uh, depends, uh, all uh, all situation in Ukraine depends on the international community. All right. Ukrainians are very brave. Yegor, thank you very much for your insights and for talking to us. Yegor Brylian, uh, talking to us on We On live from Lviv. We On is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.